session of the how the people who decided to pick the bitter end. The first speaker is Subhavat Hassel, who's going to talk about graphic tools and multi-drive on the computer. just to narrate a small story. Um, when I wrote my first paper, I had a draft, I handed it over to Amir. So he came in a weekend, he called me in, and then we basically went over the whole draft. And by the end of it, we had basically rewritten everything. And none, nothing of what I had written originally had survived. So I felt pretty bad about it. But then Amir was like, well, I've been doing it for 40 years. So thanks so much. Uh, for all of your help. Um, okay, so let me get started with what I plan to talk about today. Uh, this is based on some recent work with uh, Christian Borg, Jennifer Chase, and Shobhi Tara, who is now uh, a postdoc in Microsoft Research. And at a high level, um, I want to look at structures of large random graphs. And we want to gain some understanding of you know, certain structural characteristics of specific random graph models. Uh, so the main ideas uh, for the talk today are you know, the notion of graph limits. So I'll try to introduce this notion and argue that you know, this, this gives us a really useful tool to understand structures of large random graphs. Uh, I'll introduce, I'll start with the notion of left convergence, which is very classical by now. Um, I'll move on to sort of a new notion uh, of what people call sampling convergence. Uh, so we look at search some of its characteristics, and we'll use the, the lens of sampling convergence to look at a specific random graph model, uh, the so-called configuration model graphs. And towards the end, I hope to talk a bit about uh, some of our group ideas. OK, so let me jump uh, right into it. What are graph limits? Uh, so before I start, one disclaimer is that I'll have everything here for multigraphs. That's simply because the random graph model that I care about can lead to you know, something with multiple edges and loops. But if it's easier, you can just restrict yourself to graphs and just think of graphs throughout the talk. OK, so what is the idea of left convergence? So you have a sequence of graphs, which are growing. So n is usually the number of vertices in the graph. So these are really large sequences of graphs. And you want to under have some idea about the structure. One natural thing you can do is to sample a few vertices uniformly at random, look at the structure of the induced subgraph, which is now a random graph, and then look at its distribution, right? Uh, so the notion of left convergence basically says that if I have a sequence of graphs Gn, then I look at the induced subgraph by sampling uh, k vertices uniformly at random, look at uh, <coughs> the induced subgraph distribution, and I say that Gn converges if the corresponding probability distribution converges weakly as n tends to infinity for every k. Um, so this notion was introduced in a very different form in the early 2000s by Lovage and co-workers. Uh, this alternative formulation comes from Percy and Svante Janssen, uh, who reformulated the notion of left convergence in this form and pointed out connections to classical notions in probability, such as the Aldous Hoover theorem and exchangeability. Okay, is the notion clear? Now, what is the limit object right, uh, under left convergence? So it is what we usually call a graphon. In, in the general case, it's something like a multigraphon. But what is this object? So one uh, natural way to think about the limit object is that you have this really large graph. right? So what you can do is that you can look at its adjacency matrix. So if the graph has n vertices, this is a symmetric matrix which is of size n by n. And the ij element is 1 if there is an edge connecting vertices i and j. 
So I can uh, now go to the unit square, partition it into blocks of size one on n, um, put a zero or one, depending on whether there is an edge connecting i and j, and the hope ideally is that when n is, becomes very large, this structure somehow stabilizes and becomes a symmetric function on the unit square, uh, taking values in the, in the set zero and one. So this object is somehow the limit object, which is usually termed as a graphon. Uh, so a multigraphon is a slight generalization because if you have a multigraph, then you can have multiple edges connecting two vertices. So in general, I'll have a symmetric function uh, on the unit square where at each point x, y, I actually have a probability distribution okay, on the non-negative integer. And specifically, uh, I'll call the limit as a graphon uh, in case the distribution is supported on 0 and 1. Right? And in this case, I simply need to record w, x, y, 1, and I can forget everything. Um, okay, so this is one intuitive way to think about the limit. <coughs> a slightly more formal idea is to think of uh, what people usually refer to as the corresponding W random graph. And it gives us a very succinct way to express how the limit object actually captures structural properties of the graph sequence. So the idea is as follows. If I give you a graph on W, first sample, any random variables which are uniform, IID, on the interval. Now construct a graph with n vertices where the edges are added independently with probability W of xi, xj. Okay. And uh, <coughs> one of the results of Lovage basically says that if your graph is left convergent, then there is a graph on W such that uh, the corresponding limiting distribution for every k is basically encoded by the corresponding W random graph with k vertices. So this is precisely the sense in which the graphon is the limit for the graph sequence that I care about. Um, now, of course, once you have this notion uh, for graph convergence, it's very natural to study properties of random graphs using this notion, and, and this has been done uh, before. Uh, some of the examples here include uh, results by Borgs, Chase, Lovage, and others about you know, growing random graphs. Uh, Percy, Shorov, and Allen have results about uniformly chosen graphs with given degrees, and there are also other results about the so-called dense configuration model. So uh, one thing which I should emphasize at this point is that if you recall my notion of graph limits and graph convergence, GM here was a deterministic sequence, and the randomness was induced by the sampling procedure. Right? So when I talk about corresponding limits for random graphs, I have two levels of randomness. One due to the randomness in the graph, and then there is an added layer of randomness due to the sampling procedure. So when we talk about you know, corresponding graph on limits or uh, graph limits for random graphs, what is usually implied is that we want to look at the limits almost surely over the sequence of random graphs. Right? So this is some kind of quenched behavior that we care about. <coughs> okay. Um, okay, so far the picture seems very nice. Uh, we seem to have introduced this very nice uh, object whose properties we understand. We can study several quite involved <coughs> random graph models using this lens. Uh, everything is nice. But there is one sort of slight limitation um, to this notion in that it yields non-trivial limits only for so-called dense graph sequences. Uh, so what do I mean by dense graphs? Uh, so for example, if you look at the complete graph, then the complete graph on n vertices has ordered n squared edges. So, and in principle, you can show that whenever you have a sequence of graphs where the number of edges grows as little o to the no square of the number of vertices, uh, this procedure will give you the, the zero graph, or the zero graph on at your limit, right? So we do not really obtain um, an informative <coughs> limit whenever I have a, a sequence of sparse graphs. Okay. okay, so this brings us sort of to where we are today, which is, okay, you know, what can we do if we have a sequence of sparse random graphs? 
Now, if you think about it for a minute, you'd feel that, okay, um, the reason why this approach didn't work for sparse graphs is that I had simply too few edges. So if I sampled a fixed number of vertices at random, I would always see the empty graph as the induced sum. <coughs> Um, so one idea would be to just sample more. Why don't I keep sampling more so that I see some non-trivial structure? Right. So this is this very naive idea of p sampling. Okay. So what does it say? It says that okay, um, let g n be the sequence of graphs that I care about. Um, let t be any positive number. Okay. Now um, let me keep each vertex independently with the probability t over square root 2 pn. Okay. Now, I look at the induced subgraph. What do you see? So e is the number of edges. Technically, it's the number of non-loop edges I have. But for the moment, we can just think of it as how many edges I have. So I look at the induced subgraph. Now, what we naturally expect is that if we sample in this way, uh, it's easy to see that in expectation, I see p squared by two edges. So I see exactly order one many edges in the sampled subgraph, so this is sort of the right scaling. Um, the problem is that, of course, this might lead to a lot of isolated vertices. Right? So it's, uh, it's difficult to make sense of any limiting object if you have a lot of these dust isolated vertices floating around. So you simply say, well, I'll delete all the isolated vertices. So this is my sampling procedure. Given the graph, I'll sample every vertex independently with this probability. I'll look at the induced subgraph, and I'll throw away all the isolated vertices. And one can define this notion of sampling convergence. This was introduced in the work by Borg, Chase, Kahn, and Beach in 2017, where they said, if you give me a sequence of graphs, um, I'll call it sampling convergent if, for every t, if I look at the distribution of the induced subgraph, this converges as n tends to infinity. As before, um, the sequence Gn here is a deterministic graph sequence, um, and the randomness is introduced by this, the sampling procedure. Okay. So this is the notion of this. OK. Um, so at this point, you know, if you believe this notion of convergence, uh, one natural question would be, OK, so what is the corresponding limit? right? So we knew that in the dense case, we obtained a graph on. Um, so what do we obtain in, under this notion of convergence? So let's uh, pause for a minute and just think about uh, what happens if we follow this procedure. right? Uh, if your sequence Gn is actually a dense graph sequence, then you're sampling every vertex with probability proportional to 1 over n. And in this case, you expect to obtain a graph on. A very different uh, extreme example would be a sparse Erdos-Renyi random graph. So in this case, if you look at a graph with n vertices, the edge is added with probability pn, where pn converges to 0. If you follow this sampling procedure, you expect to see simply isolated edges. Because everything is sort of uniformly distributed, you don't have any other additional structure. Um, one, sort, one other sort of example can arise, uh, which is sort of a, a very unbalanced bipartite <coughs> graph. So for example, if you have something like a very unbalanced graph, um, On one side, you have these about order uh, root en vertices, each of who, I mean, each of these vertices having degree, which is also order square root en. Um, then one, when you sample, you expect to see a lot of these stops. Because in expectation about order one, so Poisson, many of these will be selected. Each of them will have a certain number of induced edges, so you expect to see a lot of stops. So these are sort of very different behaviors that can merge um, if you follow this sampling scheme. And in some sense, um, the main understanding is that these are the only behaviors that can emerge. Um, so the limiting object 
um, is what is called a graph X. Sorry, so I have a lot of notation here. Uh, please feel free to ignore everything beyond this point. This is some regularity condition that we need to impose. But let me explain um, the main ingredients of a graph X. Uh, so in this case, I have um, a graphon, which is even now a symmetric function, but now I have it on the quadrant rather than on the unit square. Um, I have you know, a function i, which we we'll refer to as the isolated edge sequence. So the, not the notation for multigraphs is more complicated simply because I can have you know, isolated edges, I can have isolated two edges, and so on and so forth. So I can have something like this, I can observe something like this, and so on and so forth. So I need a whole sequence. But if it's a graph, then I'll just have a number there. And then I also have a function which sort of encodes the star structures. Um, and we just need some, um, need to impose certain regularity conditions. We'll see where they uh, come from later in the talk. Okay. Um, specifically, uh, a few you know, specific cases. So, you know, as we have been uh, talking about before, so a graphon is uh, the special case when I just have simple edges. So I just have numbers, the probability distribution supported on zero and one, and in this case, I can just keep track of w, x, y, one. Similarly, the star function um, is a simple star in case everything beyond k equals one is zero, and I can just keep track of s, x, one. Um, and the same for the isolated edge concept. So I'm, I'm going through these special cases with a lot of detail simply because uh, we'll see one example later where our graphon is actually a multigraphon, um, but our star and isolated edge functions are simple ones. So in this case, I'll just refer to one simple function and a constant. So it will be implicit in that case that the star function is a simple star, the isolated edge constant is one number. Right, right, so even in the star, uh, so you can have things like, you know, you have a central vertex, then in, in the simplest case, you just have a simple star. But in the multi-edges case, you can have star edges with uh, multiple, uh, you know, multiplicity. And this is what is encoded by Sxk for k which is bigger than that. Right? Um, I would be just a number. Yes. Yeah. So in that, in that case, this limit is what we call a graph x. Uh, okay. And this is something we've talked about already. So just to make this idea a bit more concrete, uh, recall that for the dense case, we had the notion of a W random graph, and that sort of uh, made it concrete how a graph on is the limit for a sequence of dense graphs. So one can have an analogous uh, construction here. So if you give me a corresponding uh, multigraph x, then I can generate a sequence of graphs uh, w follow using the following procedure. Okay. So what do I do? <coughs> um, so I basically first have a Poisson process on the line, uh, which has a rate t. So these are sort of the potential vertices for the graph on part. For each of them, I add edges with probability w of x i x j. Then, at each of these points x i, I add stars with you know, Poisson multiplicity and rate that is proportional to t. And finally, we add isolated edges or multi edges. So this is precisely the sense in which you know, these components actually encode the structure of the dense graph on part, um, the stars and isolated edges. Okay. And of course, uh, we started with you know, a set which is infinite. So this is where the integrability conditions that I imposed in the last slide, uh, this is where these are important. So one can uh, establish that these are the necessary and sufficient conditions that one needs such that if I follow this procedure for every finite t, 
the graph that I observe has only finitely many edges. And then at the end, I basically throw away whatever isolation for me. Okay, and um, so there is, um, I mean, this is, there is, one can make this precise that these graph X's are, you know, the actual limits for sequences of multigraphs under this notion of sampling convergence. Specifically, you know, if you give me any sequence of um, graphs and if it is sampling convergent, then I can give you a specific non-random uh, graph X such that the corresponding limit distributions are encoded by the graph X process at time T. Um, okay, so this is uh, this whole notion of sampling convergence and the corresponding limit notion. Um, how do we actually say something, you know, take this notion and say something useful about random graphs? So I look at a very specific model of random graphs and uh, try to study its properties under this notion of sampling convergence. So specifically, I'll look at uh, the configuration model. Uh, this came up in Christina's talk uh, a couple of days back. Um, so let me just start with a description of the model. Uh, this is a canonical version of a multigraph with given degree sequences. Um, so you give me a sequence of degrees. Uh, let's say that you know summation di is even. Then I start with n vertices and where each vertex has di half edges. I construct a uniform mapping, and then this forms the corresponding multigraph, right? Now this matching procedure in general can produce loops as well as multiple edges. And uh, because I want to talk about almost sure properties for the sequence, I'll just construct my whole sequence on the same probability space, and I'll have independent copies. But this is not really important. Um, so as an illustration, uh, the canonical construction for these random graphs, basically, so you know, the vertices in blue are the actual vertices of my graph. Uh, they have a certain number of half edges or stubs dangling from them. Um, I actually match them uniformly. So we can do this in a sequential procedure, and then we collapse everything to obtain the following. Okay, um, so what can we say about the corresponding sequence of graphs? So we we'll always denote by ln the total um, sum of degrees. So we have very mild conditions on the degree sequence, specifically that the maximum degree is little o of you know, how many edges I have in my graph. And this condition is not really um, a restriction because you know, if I assume that every vertex in my graph has degree at least one, then ln is at, at least n. So this is not really uh, a restriction. So given my degrees, I can construct sort of an empirical measure uh, where I put mass one over square root ln at di on square root ln. And we define the constant dm as the integral of x minus 1 under this sequence of measures. So given um, these two quantities, we actually have an if and only if characterization for sampling convergence for this specific random graph sequence. So in particular, we can say that sampling convergence of this random graph sequence is equivalent to the convergence of dm to some number b. This is convergence of real numbers and rho, convergence of rho n to some limiting measure rho. This is convergence um, as the, you know, as big convergence of measures on the real line. Okay. Um, and further, once you give me this convergence, I can tell you what the corresponding limit object will be. So in this case, I can set A to be you know, this corresponding constant. And then the, the corresponding graph x limit is what is called the Caron-Fox limit with these parameters rho and a. Okay. 
So let me describe what the corresponding finite object is. So if you give me any measure rho, I can define the function rho bar. This is something like the complementary distribution function for the measure. And I can define rho bar inverse to be you know, this corresponding quantile function. So given um, the function rho bar, we define the caron fox limit as essentially the probability distribution that has a Poisson rho bar inverse x rho bar inverse y at the point x, y. And then it has rho bar inverse squared on 2 on the dial. It's a very explicit limit object. Uh, in this case, the star function is a simple function, and it's specifically the product of A and rho bar inverse. And we have an explicit isolated edge constant. Does Caron and Fox have first names? Yes. So, that's a story. So, oh, yes. <laughs> so yeah, this was uh, by Francois Caron and Emily Fox. So they introduced this model a few years ago, actually in the context of Bayesian non-parametrics. Uh, and it was very interesting for us to find that this specific random graph sequence actually converges to this random graph model that they had introduced. Um, ah, right, because, uh, so in, in the original model that Caron and Fox <coughs> had introduced, they only had the corresponding graph on them. So they didn't have the, the star function and the isolated edge constant, uh, but they can come about through this limit procedure. So this is some kind of augmented Caron Fox. Sorry? Remember? No, so A is a specific constant, right? So I have uh, the sequence of numbers Bn converging to B, so A is some specific constant. So the heuristic picture here is that uh, you have this random graph, within it you sort of have a dense core and you have a lot of isolated edges, or you know, sparse edges distributed kind of evenly. So when, once you sample this procedure, So this is big convergence on the open interval zero infinity. So there is some difference. I mean, you can have some mass vanishing at the point zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so in whatever time I have, I would like to just touch upon some of the proof ideas. Okay. Um, so I've been talking about the notion of sampling convergence and I have described the limit, but I never really told you how to actually go about proving sampling convergence. Uh, so there is a very uh, nice connection between establishing sampling convergence and establishing weak convergence for point processes. And this is actually very useful for us. Uh, so let me describe uh, this connection. So if I give you a graph, uh, one natural thing you can do uh, is you can you know, take some number s, you can sample IID labels from the interval 0s, and you can assign labels to each vertex in your graph. Okay. So instead, you know, this is like instead of calling your vertices 1, 2, so on, you just call them by real numbers. Once you do that, you can construct a point process on the first quadrant, essentially by putting um, some point mass at the point you know, u, v, v, w, these are the labels, and the, the mass that you put in is actually exactly the number of edges connecting the vertices with the labels u, v, and u, w. So this is a certain point process that one can always construct given a sequence of graphs, and the canonical labeling procedure uh, just selects s to be a specific number squared root 2 um, and, and one can see that this is you know, naturally related to the sampling procedure because in sampling convergence we were looking at uh, selecting vertices with probability t on square root 2 to n. Sorry, can I miss something? The bottom line is a definition? You're defining yes, yes, yes. So 
this in general for any S, I get a labeling procedure. The canonical labeling corresponds to this particular S. Okay. Um, and so here is the particular connection. Um, this simply says that if I have a sequence of graphs which is sampling convergent, this is equivalent to saying that the corresponding canonical labeling procedure is weakly convergent as a sequence of point processes on the first quadrant. And further, so the rest of the, the, you know, this theorem basically says that I can actually identify the corresponding graph x limit using the limit for the corresponding point process. Okay? So establishing sampling convergence is equivalent to proving weak convergence for the sequence of point processes. And if I can actually identify the limit of the canonical labeling process, I can actually read back what is the limiting graph. And, and I feel that this is sort of where the power of this notion comes from, because now, once you have established this connection, if you give me quite, I mean, actually quite complicated models of random graphs, one can use uh, robust techniques from you know, weak convergence for point processes to actually explicitly find what these limit objects will be. Um, the other fox. Okay, so in this specific case, um, so we have you know, certain specific arguments that we need. Uh, one of the useful ideas that we need is to actually compare the law for the canonical labeling process. Sort of, we have a comparison between the quenched law and the annealing law. You know, um, to recall, I want to actually derive the almost sure limits, right? So the right. Uh, so if I'm being you know, rigorous, what I should be doing is that I should draw a version of my configuration model for every n. I should fix the sequence, and then I should look at the corresponding canonical labeling process. Uh, the other object that I have here basically looks at the joint randomness <coughs> of the two processes, and we can prove that basically it's, it suffices to analyze the corresponding quenched law. And this is useful because we have then all the properties of the configuration model that we can actually utilize. Uh, this step is actually straightforward. I mean, it's just some kind of concentration inequality, but this is useful. Now, once we have this, uh, okay, so this is, this is basically a description for the corresponding labeling process that I obtain from the Theron Fox link. So the idea is that if you actually had a Caron Fox limit, one can construct a random measure and then construct a point process with uh, this particular distribution of points on the quadrant. Okay. Question? You try to say it in English. It's a lot of symbols on this. Okay. Yes. Um, sure. Uh, so the point, but take us through a little. Yeah, definitely. Well, so what this does is that it says that, suppose I give you the corresponding Caron Fox graph, right, with uh, the constant A and the measure rho, okay? So then um, the heuristic idea is that the graph on part is uh, encoded by the measure rho, and the isolated edge part and is sort of governed by the constant A. Uh, so to capture this notion, we first construct a random measure on the real line. Um, this has a Lebesgue component with you know, multiple C A. And then I have a purely or a completely random measure which puts, uh, which is discrete. It has atoms at the theta i's, which you know are Poisson point processes. And the mass that I have is rho bar inverse vi. Now, once we have this, uh, because we can construct a point process on the first quadrant with this law. And it suffices for us to prove that this is explicitly the limit for the canonical labeling process that I obtain from the configuration model. And we actually have almost exact finite or you know, finite sample bounds to this end. So we can take the canonical labeling process, so this is some point process on the first quadrant, 
you can see how many points it puts on the squares in the A cross A, and this is actually close to a Poisson distribution. And our bounds here are quantitative, and they just use uh, Stein's method for Poisson approximation. So once you have this, uh, the corresponding limit is just you know uh, weak convergence for completely random measures, have connections to learning processes, and naturally you know, the corresponding limit object naturally. So, and, okay, one other comment is that if you actually look at our limit, um, sorry, I'm jumping so much. So if you look at our limit object, it's fairly easy to see that one can construct sequences of degrees for which you can get a pure graph on, you can get a pure star, or you can get isolated edges. So you can obtain each of these pure components and certain mixture by tuning your degree sequences of Okay, um, let me finish with some question that I'm really interested in. Um, so when we started, we initially started looking at the wonderful result that uh, Percy, Shorov, and Alan have about the corresponding graphon limits for dense graphs drawn with a given degree sequence. Uh, and we really wanted to understand about the structural characteristics of this random graph in case you know, all the degrees are not of order n. Um, we are still very far from understanding that. Uh, our configuration model is sort of a proxy for this object, but it's definitely not the right thing to look at. Uh, so we definitely like to understand this moving forward. Thank you. Other questions? <laughs> So, I mean, it's, right. So, I, I mean, I would definitely say that the natural or the right sampling scheme to use depends on what one wishes to do. I feel this is one natural sampling scheme because it has you know, the direct connections to depth convergence and subsequent results in this direction have actually, they actually hint at the fact that this is one very natural generalization of depth convergence to sparse graphs. So in that sense, it's a natural one. But for other purposes, this might not be the right sampling scheme. You know, specifically, for example, uh, I can tell you one specific context. You know, if you want to look at sparse air training, and for example, if you care about questions related to large deviations of these functionals, this is probably not the right sampling scheme to look at because it simply doesn't pick up the small uh, inhomogeneity. And, and you get also Yes, so there is some mild integrability condition under that you can basically realize every graph exerts the sampling limit of some sort. Other question? If not, I'm going to speak again.